Easter through Easter tide, up to the end of Easter tide, that was Pentecost. We have been actively celebrating the actions of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Last week, which marked the end of Easter tide, we celebrated Pentecost, and this was the active mission of the third person of the Blessed Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So it seems befitting that immediately after that, we are celebrating the solemnity of the Blessed Trinity. To help us understand that the actions of the second person and the third persons of the Blessed Trinity coincide also with the action of God the Father, we celebrate three distinct persons in one substance, in one Godhead. So celebrating today's solemnity, our minds are drawn to reflect on a most sacred mystery, the nature of God. Puny mortals that we are, we cannot dare to comprehend so great a mystery. It should frighten us. Whenever we dare to speak of God, we dare to speak of that being than which nothing greater can be thought of the highest or greatest conceivable being. To even reflect on this ontological definition by Anselm still limits God to what the human mind can possibly conceive. Yet God is greater. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, contemplating on the nature of eternal life, exclaimed, What no eye has seen no ear heard or mind conceived is what God has prepared for those who love him. If this is so, then the being capable of granting these inconceivable wonders must itself be inconceivably, inconceivable by human standards. The saintly minds and the great intellectuals such as Anselm, Augustine and Aquinas have attempted to exhaust the mystery of the triune God, and they fell woefully short. It is always nice on a day like this to recall that famous story of Augustine, because in that story we see how God kindly tells us how much above us he is. Augustine was in the middle of what is known today as one of his most definitive contributions to Catholic theology. He was writing De Trinitate, that is his reflections on the Trinity. And like any normal mortal, he was faced with frustration. He couldn't continue the work. And it was in the midst of taking a break, he decided to take a walk on the lakeside to reflect on the immensity of the sea, to ponder more on this mystery. It was in this break, this frustration, that he found this little child trying to empty the sea with a little bowl into a hole that it had dug in the ground. And he could see the frustration and scowl on the child's face as he labored. And so walking up and talking to this child and the child explaining to him that oh, I'm trying to empty the sea into this hole. When Augustine explains to him that this is impossible, kindly, the same way the child looks at him and tells him, so also, it is not possible for you to ever understand the Holy Trinity. This child tells Augustine what Augustine is telling the child. And this is God revealing to his servant how great and how beyond us he is. Many have reflected on this vision of Augustine, not least Augustine himself. Who was the child? Was it an angel? Was it the baby Jesus? Why a child? Perhaps it was a child because we, were needed to rem to, we needed a reminder that unless we become like little children, we would never enter the kingdom of God. Or again, that it is to little children that the mysteries of the kingdom are revealed. We can never fully understand the mysteries of God all at once. Just as the immensity of the ocean on which Augustine was reflecting on, today scientists 
continue to discover new things each time they venture into the ocean. This means that like little children, we must keep our minds open to God who reveals himself little by little. Augustine labored on the Trinity, his work on the Trinity for 30 years without ever finishing it. But maybe that itself is instructive because how could he ever finish what had no end, what has no end? The triumph God is eternal, ineffable. Yes, he is wider than the oceans we sing. He is deeper than the depths, yet he dwells within our hearts. There is none like him. In writing the Trinity, Augustine would finally understand that if we ever fully knew or understood God, then he is no longer God. We are to embrace this mystery through faith and reason. Hear his words. It is difficult, he says, to contemplate and fully know the substance of God, who fashions things changeable, yet without any change in himself, and creates things temporal, yet without temporal movement in himself. And it is necessary, therefore, to purge our minds in order to be able to see ineffably that which is ineffable. Whereto not having yet attained, we are to be nourished by faith and led by such ways as are more suited to our capacity that we may be rendered apt and able to comprehend it. Let us ponder a little on Thomas Aquinas. He was nicknamed the dumb big ox of Sicily because as a child, he was a slow thinker. But with the unrelenting childlike disposition to know and serve God, he quickly blossomed into one of the greatest thinkers of his age. His seminal work, the Summa Theologiae, which I know all of us here are familiar with, touches on almost every aspect of Catholic thought and speech about God. This work too, towering as it may be, also remained unfinished. On December 6th, 1273, while celebrating the Eucharist, Aquinas was given a glimpse of heaven. This experience changed him forever. He realized that all his works, written from the highest physical sense and the most intense illumination, fell so far short of what he saw, he never wrote again. And when encouraged by his secretary to at least finish his summa, he famously replied, I can do no more. The end of my labors has come. Such things have been revealed to me that all I have written seems to me as so much straw. Now I await the end of my life after that of my works. He would die three short months later, aged 48. The irony, the dumb ox of Sicily, one of the most brilliant men of his age, an erudite scholar and doctor of the church, reverts to calling himself a dumb ox by referring to his works as straw. Such, my dear friends, is the eminence of God before the wisdom of men. The Jews knew this well and could never utter the name of God whenever they read the scriptures. Now a word of caution here for you, my dear seminarians, especially those of you in the Theological Institute, the Theology Institute. Do not be tempted to tell your professors of dogma and theology that all the Thomas Aquinas that they are teaching you is nothing but straw, especially as your exams are fast approaching. You will be toying with failure. It will not all go well for you. Just remember you are not Thomas Aquinas. The understanding of God as a trinity is what sets Christianity apart from other monotheistic religions. That God is one in three distinct persons and that there are three distinct persons in one God. That the persons of the blessed trinity, though distinct, share in one substance, in a single Godhead. Of course, there are things in nature that we may allude to to help our understanding of the possibility of such an existence. 
We talk about the relationship between water, ice, and vapor, or fire, light, and warmth. Yet, the Trinity is deeper. St. Athanasius tells us, the Father makes all things through the Word and in the Holy Spirit. And in this way, the unity of the Holy Trinity is preserved. Accordingly, one Godhead is preached, one God who is above all things and through all things and in all things. Think of God the Father as God for us, God the Son as God with us, and God the Holy Spirit as God within us. This teaching of God as Trinity is replete in, in scriptures and reinforced in our liturgy. Accordingly, we began this Mass by invoking the Holy Trinity. The opening greeting was done in the name of the Trinity, and the final blessing will be imparted in the name of the Trinity. In our first reading today, God the Father is presented to us as the Creator who spoke to the people from the heart of a fire. Moses here, of course, was referring to the Exodus experience when the people gathered at the foot of a mountain, Mount Sinai, and God descended on the mountain in fire. This scene terrified the people so much that they promised Moses total obedience, but they were not consumed. This is also reminiscent of Moses' call when God spoke to him again in a burning bush that, was not, that wasn't consumed by the fire. The voice of the Father in a mountain, the presence of fire. These are symbols of the distinct persons of the Trinity. The voice of the Father would be heard again at the baptism of Jesus and at his transfiguration. This first reading concludes with a reminder of how God rescued his people from slavery and how he restored them into a new land. All of this prefiguring the action of the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who would come to actuate this in his suffering and death for the salvation of the world. So God the Father sends the Son, who taking flesh in the mystery of incarnation becomes like us in all things but sin. He rescues us from sin by means of his suffering and death, and in turn gives us the Holy Spirit, which St. Paul in the second reading tells us is what enables us to call God our Father. It is by virtue of this Spirit we are able to become heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Thus, we witness the working of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in perfect communion, in perfect harmony for our salvation. The power of the Holy Spirit is to teach us and enlighten us about God. Hence, last Sunday, we celebrated Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and the birth of the church. We recounted how the apostles spoke in tongues and different peoples heard them in their own languages. There are two possible interpretations to that account. First is that the apostles spoke in different languages and the peoples present understood them. The second could be that the apostles spoke only one language and all the peoples heard them in their different languages. Whatever interpretation one chooses, the implication is the same, that the unity of peoples was achieved. From the communion that exists in the actions of the Holy Trinity, creation by the Father, redemption by the Son, and sanctification by the Spirit, every culture, language, and people have been marked by the spark of God, waiting to be kindled into flames of faith. Furthermore, we may ask, what one language is there which, when spoken, everyone, regardless of creed, race, or tongue, can understand? That language is love. Love is the universal language. Everyone knows when they are loved. Children, the young, the old, all can relate to this universal language. When you feel loved, you simply know it. And where love is present, no words are necessary. Love is all. Thus, St. John will tell us, God is love. And he who loves abides in God, and God abides in him. The Holy Trinity, my dear friends, is the revelation of love and a communion of love. 
John 3.16 tells us, For God the Father so loved the world that he sent his Son, who out of love lays down his life for all of us, John 15.16. And in a similar love, he breathes the Holy Spirit on his disciples to teach us all things, to bring us to grow in the knowledge of God and of our communion with him. My dear brothers and sisters, the nature of the Holy Trinity teaches us the true meaning of Christ's priestly prayer, that they may be one as you and I are one. It is a call to recognize as Christians our essential unity in Christ. The more we know God, the more loving we would be. For no one can love God who does not love his fellow man. I end with a documentary I watched, and this documentary was just a little questionnaire survey that was being made amongst the elderly, people who were in their 80s, in their 90s and above. And the question always was, what advice would you give your younger self if you could? And the common denominator in all the advice or pieces of advice that they've left was to have a good and loving relationship. They each said to love more, that that was what was most important, not money, not wealth. This is the advice they would give to their younger selves, people in their 80s and 90s. The Blessed Trinity, a communion, a relationship of love, is teaching us that if you want to live long and a healthy life, you must immerse yourself also in a relationship of love. A 1938 Harvard research also reveals the same thing. From participants all over the world who were followed and interviewed across the years, who lived so long, always revealed that a positive, loving relationship was what led them to have a happier, healthier, and longer life. Love, my dear friends, is the strongest proof that we are created by the Holy Trinity. Love is what makes us truly happy. We are created to love and be loved. And this seems to suggest to us that if you want to live forever, you must have a relationship with God, the eternal communion of love. And when our relationships mirror a communion of love, we can build a community of love. This is what the final command of our Lord to his disciples and to us in today's gospel means. Go, make disciples of all nations. Go, build communities of love in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is this same command that will dismiss us at this Mass. Ite me saest, this is your mission. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen.